Now, our topic today is sex as metaphysical. Uh, so far as sex, the topic belongs to philosophy. It is a normative uh, issue and therefore, of course, presupposes free will. So we're going to treat the topic in the pattern that we've developed for ethical issues. In other words, at the outset, we restrict our observations about sex to people that we regard as rational. And then at the end, we come back to sex and the life of the non-rational. That's just what we did on egoism, for example. We've already discussed that you can't generalize about the good, including here the proper meaning of an activity such as sex, by indiscriminately intermingling observations of good and bad people. You can't ask, for instance, what does sex mean without asking means to whom? And it would be tantamount to trying to reach the meaning of work in human life by generalizing from the attitude of Howard Rourke, Peter Keating, and Cuffy Miggs. Now, it's true that sex is metaphysical for irrational men also. So it's not a contradiction. But you can't understand the application to bad men until you first understand the case of good men. All right, to uh, motivate you to want to induce, I'm going to do what I always do and give you the standard or a standard rationalist deduction. The argument that many objectivists use instead of observing reality in order to prove this principle and therefore convince themselves that induction is a waste of time. There's countless of these arguments on any objectivist principle. And you can find them on the internet. Dozens of people who prove things a priori from arbitrary premises and are convinced that they've proved something. If this course accomplishes anything, it should be to blast the, a method of this out of uh, your approach. Here's a standard bad but rationalist argument. Sex involves emotion. Emotion involves value judgments. Value judgments are based ultimately on your view of the universe, in other words, on your metaphysics. Therefore, sex is metaphysical. Now, see, I could do that every day, all day, on every topic, on anybody's philosophy. I could prove Leibniz and Plato and, and Clinton. It just depends on where you start and you just construct a plausible sounding chain. Uh, now, the only trouble with this particular argument, all the premises are true, is that there is absolutely nothing unique about sex in this argument. Clothes, career, gardening, whatever you value you want to name in one way or another uh, involves emotion and therefore involves value judgments and therefore ultimately rests on a view of reality. So that means every value then is metaphysical. So metaphysical becomes a uselessly broad term. It has no content. Now, the, uh, if we had longer, I'd give you a lot more bad arguments. The point is you can't get anywhere by that approach. So let us try positively to go to uh, reality. Now, in this case, I'm not going to, at the beginning, give you the standard reduction from sex is metaphysical and back step by step all the way. And there are several reasons for this. Basically, I want to follow my own actual mental process. When I worked out this lecture, um, because uh, I don't always know the reduction at the outset the way I'm giving it to you. Many times I have to fumble and grope to reach the reduction, which I then give you in a neat order at the beginning. So since we're coming to the end, I thought I'd give you one and show you more what is another strategy to find the reduction uh, as we're going. And it happened that sex is a good one to do because at, on a certain level, it's easily perceivable, for instance, as against justice or rationality and so on. And it is not, uh, on the basic uh, observational level, 
up to a point it is not a subtle or complicated topic. Even force, for instance, which is uh, easily perceivable, but it's the effects on the mind are not are a whole complexity. But um, uh, some things with regard to sex are simply obvious, perceivable, observable, and uh, you can get them without having any advanced guide as to uh, how to reduce or how to find them. So instead of starting by reduction, uh, I'm going to go in both directions today, which is what I actually did in real life. I'm going to start by seeing what I can observe about the phenomenon of sex, rel you know, relevant to what I know we're aiming at, what I can observe about it, and go up step by step, and then when I get stuck, figure out what questions would help me and go up some more, and then at a certain point, I don't know where to go anymore, go up to metaphysical and work back by reduction and then find that the two chains meet. So then in other words, instead of starting with sex as metaphysical and working all the way down to observation, I'm going to start with observation and work up to a point and then go to sex is metaphysical and work backward and hope to reach the point where I stopped and then put the two together into one chain and that would be the reduction. So that's a, that is a technique you can use if you don't know what you're doing. You work in two directions at once. If you can figure a starting point, it's a topic like sex that there's some pretty obvious things that you can start by observing. You see, then you can work up and then work down to meet it. You'll see as we go. And this gives you a little more freedom if you don't know where you're going. You can try in two different directions. But you have to meet in the middle. Now, what then is the most obvious thing that uh, everyone with any faculty of awareness can observe about sex? So you don't need any inference at all. It's directly perceivable. The youngest teenager knows it. Uh, and that is, it is enjoyable. It is a pleasure. And as obvious as that is this, that it is a large, a big, an intense pleasure. And here, uh, experienceable by anyone, there is a whole range of pleasures. You don't need objectivism for this. Correlated with a whole range of values. The greater the value, the greater the pleasure on gaining it, and similarly for the lesser side. This is another case of John Stuart Mill's concomitant variation that we've seen several times last time, for instance, with force and paralysis. It's a widely known induction, and you can easily perform this one, the relation between value and pleasure, uh, on your own if you haven't already. I'll uh, just give you, for instance, a list of uh, possible values, and you rate them from your own experience or observation in regard to the intensity or violence of the pleasure. That's what we're talking about. The shuddering quality uh, of it on a scale of 1 to 10. Uh, you find a good light bulb to replace a burned out one. Now, these are not in any order, necessarily. Uh, you have a good meal. You have a great meal. You have a good workout at the gym. You have a good talk with a close friend. You read a good book, say Adler Shrugged. You write a good book, say Adler Shrugged. You create a philosophy which saves the world. Uh, you have a good lovemaking experience with a good woman or man. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, only one of these gets a 10. And uh, the inductive conclusion here is that sex is the most intense pleasure. That is directly observable. It's the jackpot of pleasurable intensity. Now, I hasten to say, I am not saying that every moment of sex for a rational person is of the topmost intensity. Obviously, there's a range. 
There are different moments, moods, days, which are more exciting than others. But the point is that at its best, sex has an intensity a po in terms of a positive experience unequaled in any other experience. It's the most violent positive experience. Now, some of you will think of an experience at work uh, that will strike you as being very pleasurable, but work is not characteristically intense, violent pleasure. On the contrary, it involves a lot of effort and even some agony. And uh, the experience at work is usually drawn out across long periods. If you experience that kind of violence at work, you would not get very much done because you wouldn't be able to concentrate. So uh, what uh, we want to do now is try to grasp what is the nature of this sexual pleasure, this extremely uh, intense uh, pleasure. What is, uh, oh no, just before that I had one point that I wanted to make which is also uh, 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 obvious, obvious to everyone basically but Catholics. And that is that people enjoy sex as an end in itself, not a means to an end. Now this of course is rejected by various religious people, but that's irrelevant observationally. In the same way that it's irrelevant uh, that communists demand that art be propagandistic, your actual experience of art is that it's an end in itself, not a means uh, to an end. And your, your direct experience of sexual pleasure is that there's no further motive other than the experience of this pleasure. You don't engage in it, and here you have to rely on introspection as a means primarily to make babies or to endure graduate school, or to relax after a hard day at work, or to improve your marriage. Now, of course, any achievement of a value leads to pleasure, but the vast majority of values are not ends in themselves. Sex, however, is an end in itself, although it's not unique uh, in this regard. A number of things could be regarded as ends in themselves, but that happens to be one thing that's observable about sex. No concrete result needs to come from it, nor do you have to aim at any such result. You do it for uh, its own sake. So basically you get from observation that it's a pleasure, it's the most intense pleasure, and you pursue it for its own sake. And this is the point at which now we're trying to identify uh, the nature of this pleasure. We know it comes from a value. What is the underlying uh, value involved? We're just pursuing this as a question. We don't know the answer. You know, there's many different kinds of pleasure and many different kinds of pain. So the thought that occurred to me at this point, so I'm trying to work my way into what is this. Met I want to do it methodically. I want to be sure I find out what is the real kind of pleasure and what are the values and so on involved. I have to be able to identify sexual pleasure in relation to other pleasures. I have to be able to, because that's the only way you can tell what something is. The only answer to what is something is it's like this and it's not like this. That's the genus differential method. So, aha, uh -huh, what we need is a methodical statement of the genus and then all the different kinds and categories and see where sex would go. Uh, and that will give us the, uh, like the agenda or what we have to induce and what contrasts we're making in order to grasp what it is. Now here is where I found the, the genus method the most useful uh, of, any, uh, of any of the topics. I couldn't proceed without some idea, well, what am I contrasting this to and comparing it to, and how do I know? I can't just start at random with pleasures, so I have to categorize pleasures, and that was directly uh, the genus method. So the genus I picked is basically pleasurable experiences have causes. Now, if we wanted to be really, um, uh, really cast the net broadly to include pain, 
because you can learn a lot about sex by con contrasting it to certain kinds of pain as well as by comparing it to certain kinds of pleasures. You can make your genus extremely broad, just experiences, whether positive or negative. Experiences have causes, and then you could have the two wings, pleasure and pain, and then subdivide all of them. But the problem with that is, it's too much to write. It makes your your uh, thing so sprawled and spread out. So I'm going to do it just under pleasure, but with the understanding that in the back of our mind we could do it with pain also, and we'll come back to that later. What is the first division that I would make of pleasurable experiences here? The first subdivision. Well, I keep in mind that I am aiming at the conclusion that sex is metaphysical. It's some kind of pleasure pertaining to reality as such. I don't have any clue at this stage of my induction what, but it's good enough for me to distinguish sex, for instance, from the pleasure of a new toothbrush. Now, a new toothbrush is a very specialized pleasure. There's a specific concrete thing in reality that I want, and then when I get it, it's a, it gives me pleasure because it satisfies things as a means to an end. That I'm going to call that type of thing a specialized pleasure. And all specialized pleasures are specific things that you want as a means to an end. And then I'll contrast that you can either call it metaphysical right here, or just call it generalized pleasure. That is something that is not some specific object in reality that we're after, and not, therefore, a means to an end. Some kind of, we don't know yet exactly what it means, some kind of generalized connection to reality that is experienced as an end in itself. That's going to be our first subdivision. Now, that would not necessarily be my subdivision if I had a different goal in mind, but I'm trying to reach the metaphysical nature, so I want to distinguish, in effect, metaphysical from specialized or journalistic or concrete-oriented uh, pleasures. Now, within specialized, uh, it's, it's clear that there's basically two different categories that come under pleasure. You can call it the sensations and emotions, like the sensations of pleasure and then the emotion of, of pleasure. Or you can call it the, the physical and the psychological. And most things are a mixture, but you can generally arrange things as dominantly physical or dominantly psychological to the extent to which sensations are dominant or emotions are dominant. So a warm coat in a storm may have some emotional element, but that will be dominantly a physical pleasure. On the other hand, creative work is dominantly a psychological, emotional pleasure. Talking to friends, Talking to uh, a psychologist about your virtues. I say about your virtues because if it's about your vices, it doesn't come under pleasure. But all of that would be dominantly psychological or emotional. Those are all still specialized pleasures, right? There are specific aspects of reality you're dealing with as means to various ends. Now let's go under the generalized category that don't pick out specific aspects of reality and are not means to an end. Is there any sensation or physical, purely physical or dominantly physical? I can't think of any. Because if it was sensation, it would be related to some specific concrete. You can want to experience a sensation just for the sake of experiencing it, but then there's going to have to be something that it contributes uh, to your overall well-being. If you work out, you can only do that up to the point where it's good for you, where it develops you, where you get a certain kind of exercise, not once you're exhausted or when you've eaten, etc. So that still comes out as being a specialized. It's not generalized in the sense that I'm after here, that it has a relation to reality as such. So that, as a generalized category, I think is, is a null class. In the, in the psychological category, under generalized, I think that an obvious example would be art. Now, art 
again has a has a sensory element to it, but the pleasure is not primarily the aesthetic pleasure is not primarily from the sensation. And then that raises the question: Where do we put uh, sex here? And that becomes then the first question that we have to answer, which we haven't yet answered. It's some kind of pleasure. Uh, we've already established it's an end in itself. Does it go under psychological? Does it go under physical? Where does it go? So the sheer act of filling out the genus, of laying out before you the different types of pleasures, forces you now to raise the question, which we'd have to observe by discover by observation, uh, is... Uh, Sexual pleasure, physical or psychological? Is it a sensation? Is it an emotion? Or what? So start with the hypothesis. I'm assuming you don't already know objectivism on this topic. Maybe, uh, maybe this uh, most intense uh, experience is purely uh, physical. Well, is there evidence for that? Well, the fact that there is some definite evidence for that observationally animals crave sex too uh, so that is not something unique to human beings and it's also obvious that uh, uh, physical sensation is essential uh, to sex that is not a peripheral or tangential element uh, to put it in the you can observe this in your own experience but to put it in the crudest terms there is no sexual ecstasy without friction and that is an easy uh, induction so except as you're projecting it so perhaps uh, we could reach this point maybe no emotions are involved nothing spiritual or psychological maybe it just is in effect a really world-class nerve ending now however before we rush to judgment, so to speak. We have to see if is there anything else we could observe about sex that would point us in a different direction. Now, nothing is going to remove the major physical element. That remains a fact. But is there another element involved in addition? So, again, we have to go out and observe. And the question here is then, are there factors involved that definitely affect the pleasure but don't seem to involve a change in bodily activity that would have no effect on animals. So we have a real test suggesting that something is not merely sensory. If it doesn't actually change the physical sensations and it would be meaningless or boring to animals but not to human beings, then that obviously indicates that something is appealing to the human conceptual faculty about it and not simply to the physical. Now here you can compile a huge list of factors that contribute to sexual pleasure that fulfill that. The fact that you have a partner, uh, uh, the one who enacts the friction so to speak, that uh, uh, makes a big difference as against animals. And why this would be important if the pleasure is purely sensory is unclear. Now, I think you can project uh, from your own uh, experience and fantasies what difference different partners would make to the pleasure even if the activities were the same. Uh, I have graphic examples here, but I think I'll save time. The setting, the background is obviously important to human beings, and yet that's nothing uh, to animals and makes no inherent difference to the sensations involved. Uh, but it can make a huge difference to a human being whether the act is performed in a bedroom or an office desk, a deserted beach at night, or a packed beach at high noon. Uh, with this kind of music or that kind, Rachmaninoff or heavy metal or silence. And, uh, after uh, a quarrel, uh, after a creative performance by your partner with lighting, 
uh, with fragrance, with cameras, and if so, who's operating and where, etc., etc., etc. Again, I'm just cutting this list because uh, I think the point uh, is obvious. You just go through his or her body uh, from head to toe, including all uh, elements, orifices, and combinations, and you can figure out that some things turn you on and some don't, even if the genital uh, element remains unaffected. So it's clear that there's abundant evidence from which to induce that the pleasure of sex depends heavily on psychological factors that make no difference to the sensations and have no significance to an animal. They make a difference to the experience, but not to the actual uh, nerve endings that are being uh, aroused. So, what conclusion do we come to on the basis of observation? This is a pleasure that seems to involve both body and mind. It seems to be made of two components. It's the most intense physical sensation and the most intense emotional which implies then, of course, from our, from our greatest or highest or strongest, whatever you want to say, chosen evaluations. So we can say, just restating this observational point, it's a pleasure of the person as a total person, mind and body. It's an all-engulfing pleasure, permeating every element essential uh, to his being. So on our chart, we wouldn't put it under physical or under psychological, even under the issue of dominantly. It would have to go in a new category, physical slash psychological, with both as being absolutely essential. And you couldn't distinguish one as being crucial and the other as just a, a side issue. So we're in this position summarizing now just where we are now and this is where I was trying to of course I knew that point before I started but I still had to figure out why I need that point and where does it come in in the process of, of the induction we have an, a the most intense pleasure an end in itself involving the total person mind and body in a way that doesn't seem to have any counterpart on either the specialized or the generalized pleasure. So what we want to know is, what is the value being pursued that would, could account for this kind of intensity experienced as an end in itself? In some sense, a value is what you're after. What are you after in sex? What are you aware of? What are you focusing on? Now, it's not easy to answer this question by introspection because there's, in one sense, you're not focusing because you're not concentrating and studying and so on. And in another sense, you're focusing on the sensation of the moment or the, you know, the person that's right there. So it's not easy by introspection to say, what is your mind grasping so to bring out the answer, I think you need three major contrasts. I went over everything that I could put under these different categories. Uh, and I think that the most helpful, and what I had to try to do in working it out originally is to try to figure out which things most bring out something I want to reach about sex. And the three that I... Uh, the, the first one was work because work is a major value according to objectivism it's the greatest value within the specialized uh, category so if we can contrast sexual pleasure with the pleasure of creative work we'll get some idea why it goes in the generalized category versus in the specialized but that then brings in 
under the specialized, the main, under the generalized, the main value that we could identify that, that had a psychological element was art. So then how does sex uh, relate to art? The more we can make a distinction there, the more we can pin down exactly what is the nature of sex in this generalized category. So the assignment is sex versus work sex versus art to try to grasp by observation what the essential difference in the underlying value or focus is and then uh this i brought in just because i happen to know that this was important sex versus its exact antonym its equivalent in the pain genus if you had a, a whole category of pain divided into specialized and generalized and physical and psychological, etc. There is an exact counterpart of sex, which is equally physical and psychological, comes under the generalized category and is the most intense pain you can have. And therefore, if you can, once you've got sex pinned down through its contrast to work and art, then contrast it with the other, that's the final thing needed to bring out entirely uh, its nature. It helps to define what makes it a positive experience by contrasting everything else the same except on the negative side. So I hope you see this is not just arbitrary. I tried to pick out things that would highlight why is it in the generalized category? How does it differ from other things in that? And then what makes it the positive rather than the negative? So those three well, isolate. And that's as far as I could go before turning around and saying, well, now that, let's go back to sex as metaphysical and see where I, whether I can connect to this. So let's take these now in the order that um, I have them, just giving you them. So start with creative work. And I, when I gave this last year, Tiger Woods had just come in uh, to prominence. Uh, I'm using that same example. I didn't change it, the golfer. Uh, but uh, he's a good example in this case because by the nature of his profession, mind and body are both equally involved and both at their peak. Now you could argue that all human work is an integration of mind and body. But if you're just sitting writing a book year after year, it's not as apparent what the physical element is besides it just holds your brain and your hand while you're moving it. And if you're a Japanese sumo wrestler, it's not as apparent, you know, what the role of the mind is. But in Tiger Woods, it's, it's like the perfect balance and union of a superb body and physical skill and continuous concentration and intellect and, and so on. So, if, the question becomes that we want to compare, contrast the pleasure. Does he feel the same pleasure of mind and body golfing as you do making love? Now here, you have to introspect and then watch him golf and project. Um, obviously, he loves the game. But equally obvious is that the game is a work. Uh, he enjoys excelling, but excelling involves unremitting effort, especially when you work for six to eight hours at a time, day after day. So his mental focus is necessarily on doing the job. The enjoyment he feels is a side issue in terms of his moment-by-moment -moment focus. Does he feel good about himself while driving off the tee? Oh, of course. He feels subconsciously, in effect, I'm really great at golf. But this is a delimited emotional experience, an occasional side glance, as with any teacher or actor or any performer. His primary focus is not on himself, but on the wind direction, the club head, the angle that he's holding it, the layout of the hole, etc. Does he feel that the world is a great place to be? Of course, he feels implicitly, the way I'm playing today, it's a great life. But again, that is only an implicit side glance. Now, the point here 
is to contrast your experience of sex with the experience of an expert's performance at work, even where that expert involves the full participation of mind and body. In both cases, you and Tiger Woods, the body and mind are 100% involved, but in your case, it, in the sexual case, it's not as a performer keeping track of a dozen constantly varying factors, monitoring, focusing, directing, etc. In work, you're basically focused outward on performing or creating an achievement, and that is an essentially outer-directed awareness. If you're self-confident, you know you can do it. You're glad the world is open to your skill. But self-focus or world in general focus or self-congratulation is peripheral and too much of it is distracting. But in sex, you are not there to create, perform, or achieve. The idea is you're there to experience this ecstasy of the moment as an end in itself. So a very different kind of focus on yourself is involved. It's different in two distinct ways. You focus on yourself as a total versus as a specialized performer. And the focus on yourself is central to the experience versus peripheral or occasional. So somehow, we don't know entirely how yet. Sex features you as a total in the world as a total. As against the Tiger Woods or, or professional case, which is you as an expert in a specific, concretely defined field. Now that points us in a crucial direction. We're getting the first hints or understanding of why sex is going to belong in the generalized or metaphysical category. Because you take part in it not as a specialized actor with a specialized skill, but as a total person, somehow in relation to the total world. Now that already gives you a whole unique slant on where you're going to go, you see, with sex. And I don't see how you would get there, except certainly you wouldn't get there by plain introspection. It has to be by contrasting one type of experience with another. All right, now to nail that down, let us go to the contrast with art, or the comparison and contrast. Now, art is an end in itself. Uh, you know that Ayn Rand has called it metaphysical. There's a lot of similarities between art and sex. In both cases, crucial fundamental values are somehow essential to the experience. In both cases, person's response is a highly personal but there is still a crucial difference between the pleasure of art and sex. Your mind and body are not at the center of your focus in art. In fact, it would be completely distracting if you were contemplating a work of art with that kind of focus. You have to establish now by observation and induction yourself the difference, for instance, between reading Atlas Shrugged and making love. But one thing which is essential is that in art, your focus is outward, is external, as it would be in work. Where the difference from work is that you focus not on things as they are and how to change or improve them, but the external as recreated by an artist. You enter and perceive his universe whether you love it or hate it. But either way, whether you love it or hate it, you forget yourself in art. 
you're aware of your reaction to the work, but merely as a reaction to something outside yourself that consumes your attention. If you read Atlas Shrugged, for instance, you live in its world while reading the book, and that is all there is to you during that experience. If in the course of reading somebody says, what are you? You'd say, I am the person reading the, this book, perceiving these events, meeting these characters. So you're entranced by and in love with John Galt or Dagny Tiger or the John Galt line or whatever it is. Now, of course, your response to a work of art implies something about you and this world. Uh, but that is not the focus of uh, the experience. In sex, by contrast, the focus is some kind of self-awareness. You as a total entity are the fundamental object of the experience. So you get what we have here. We have a generalized pleasure that has an essentially internal uh, focus. Now, an internal focus you can have on a specialized level too, as in, you know, a positive introspection, where you're trying to identify something good about yourself, say with a therapist or with a friend, and you get pleasure out of realizing. But that is a specialized focus of a specific virtue that you're discovering. But here, it's a positive self-awareness of yourself as a total. And that's the essence of the experience which you pursue for its own sake. Now we have to take a detour or an answer a question here. What then is the role of a partner if sex is only or is essentially a self-focus? Now the whole topic of sex involves a lot of stuff that doesn't belong to philosophy, but you can't separate it out entirely. And uh, this is a, is, is a psychological element, but we have to just mention this so that it's not totally confusing. I'm just going to indicate the kind of points here that would be involved, but you need a lot of inductions to reach these. Uh, it would be a whole philosophy or theory of sex. I think you're familiar with this point. I'm just trying to answer the question of why would somebody want a partner if this basic view or approach to sex is, is correct. Uh, and I think you're familiar with the point that and we're speaking about a rational person wants the partner because he or she, Now I'm not going to keep saying all those pronouns, but you can switch them as you wish in any combination that suits your preference because he or she represents the sum of his fundamental values. Otherwise, he wouldn't experience a, a profound emotional response such as love. So the woman must, in essential value terms, be just like him, or putting it in Aristotle's great term, has to be his alter ego, another self. So that when he looks at and touches her, he sees all of his most crucial, deeply personal values, and the same when she looks at and touches him. She sees her most crucial values. Now, the, the response of each to the other is meaningful precisely because what they see and respond to is their own essence as they themselves see it. That is what one is flaunting and the other is taking in. Uh, if a woman is indifferent to a man's essence, or if she sees in him or cares primarily about anything other than what he regards as his essential, then sex with her to a rational man is dead. It's impossible. And here there's a very eloquent scene from The Fountainhead, a very brief one. I'm going to take a second uh, to read about Gail Winan when he was 20 and he was in love with this exquisitely beautiful girl. What was her name? Uh, I, can't, I don't think they ever gave her a name. Did they? No. Anyway, <clears throat> this is the paragraph. With I'll just excerpt a little bit. They said little to each other. He felt that everything was understood between them. One evening he spoke. 
Sitting at her feet, his face raised to her. He allowed his soul to be heard. My darling, anything you wish, anything I am, anything I can ever be, that's what I want to offer you. Not the things I'll get for you, but the thing in me that will make me able to get them. I'm skipping it forward. And she, the girl smiled and asked, do you think I'm prettier than Maggie Kelly? He got up, he said nothing, and walked out of the house. He never saw that girl again. Now, that is a very condensed uh, uh, version of uh, why of this point. But the point is that she didn't see her respond to him. Him as a total, as he saw himself. Because in, in proper, meaningful sex to a rational person, the mutual focus is a way for each to underscore and make real an utterly self-centered awareness. E the focus of each on himself or herself. I got, I'm losing my pronouns, so let's put it like this. Sex to a rational man is a totally egotistical or egoistical experience. And the partner makes it more so, which is why he wants the partner. It's the experience I underscored want her. I want her because she's another me. I want that other me to feast on me. See, so that it, what it is is a stress or an underscoring of self-focus and self-awareness. So it, the need of a partner does not contradict uh, uh, the issue that s sex is a self uh, focus. Uh, properly understood, it simply enhances that point. But that was a side excursion. Let's go back to our main line. Sex involves you as a total entity, body and mind. We're summing it. Experiencing a, vi a violent pleasure through both attributes. A pleasure you seek for its own sake, and it involves a focus on and positive, obviously, evaluation of your essential self. It's not a focus on any specific skill you have in any specific field, that's the Tiger Woods, but on yourself as such and the world as such. And this latter object, this yourself in the world, has got to in some way involve your highest value because the experience of it leads to the most intense pleasure. Okay? Now we go to Clarify and proceed to the other kind of contrast, the third point, the exact opposite of sex, would be an equivalent focus. That is on you as a total, in the world as a total, not a specialized focus. A generalized focus, but that involves a negative evaluation. Yourself as a total mind and body, as a total person, but now with a condemnation rather than a positive. And do you know what that is called? That's regarded universally as the worst suffering human beings are capable of. And it's the same as sex exactly, but on the negative axis. It's the generalized mind-body, I can't say end in itself, but horror in itself. And what is that? Do you know? An anxiety attack. And you can, you can gain a great understanding of sex by simply clinical observation of anxiety attacks in relation to sexual experiences. And you can get abundant data. They differ in everything, but this crucial similarity is uh, what we want to bring out. A man with an anxiety attack, and this is easily elicitable, by psychological clinical observation is terrified regardless of his life situation, his knowledge, his skills, or even his strengths of character. He can be sitting at home safely on his sofa and suddenly, seemingly out of the blue, have this profound, overwhelming feeling, I can't cope, I'm no good, I'm going crazy, and even I'm going to die. Now, sex is the exact opposite of the same experience. You just reverse everything. You can be trapped in a foxhole, 
with bombs raining down, and this has frequently happened. But uh, people make love under th that circumstance, assuming you're still capable of it. If you're too overcome by fear, you can't do it. But if you can, then regardless of the tangible dangers or of any of your errors or flaws or problems, you still feel, if you can get into it at all, during the act of sex, I am efficacious, I am good, I am in control, I can succeed, I can live, I'm fabulous. And in that sense, it's the experience of self-affirmation. Now, if, if we know from egoism that you yourself are your highest value, then sex comes out as being simply the positive experience of this value. That is, of yourself as an entity. What you experience is, by my deepest essence, I am great. Just as the meaning of the anxiety attack is, by my deepest essence, I am worthless. So if an anxiety attack is an experience of self-condemnation or self-damnation, then, as Ayn Rand put it, sex is the experience of self-celebration. Now you see that both of these estimates, celebration and damnation, belong in the generalized, not the specialized category. And this is the full final clarification of why it comes under that category. Self-celebration does not mean I'm great at a given skill. And it doesn't make any difference what skill you're talking about, and even whether you actually excel in it. You can be a great writer and experience pride in being a great writer. That is not what we're talking about as self-celebration. The same goes for anything, hockey, you name it. Self-celebration is the idea, I am great. Great as such. And then parenthesis. And therefore, potentially at least, I'm great at anything that's important to me and that I decide to work at. But it's not a it's not an inventory of your positives and a sense of satisfaction. That would be a specialized, even if compound, feeling. Similarly, self-condemnation, in the sense we're talking about it here, is not, I am a poor cook, I'm sloppy, I can't write, etc. It's, I am no good. No good as such. No good for anything that really counts. So we've come to the, as far as sex is self-celebration. Now, there's another element that's involved in the generalized feeling, according to Ayn Rand. Uh, we could deduce it from self-celebration. -cel but rather than deduce it, let's reach it as Ayn Rand did, by induction. And this induction is given directly in Atlas Shrugged. She put a certain scene in specifically to illustrate a point about sex. And I'm referring here to the sequence about sex and, and its, its nature. The sequence involving Reardon's attendance at a disgusting political meeting. Um, you can think of it, it would be like the Philadelphia Summit on Volunteerism. And he is completely sick with disgust, at which point he loses all desire for Dagny, for whom before this event he had an uns unslakable, insatiable passion. Now I think everyone has experienced equivalence of this asexuality at some point or another. And it has nothing to do with the negative estimate of yourself. And your feeling is rather, I still want to celebrate my own self, but not this moment. Not in a world smeared with the excrement of the White House occupant or his equivalent. So the inductive inference is, it matters to a man's sexual desire what kind of world he thinks he's living in. Now here again, the issue is not specialized. It's not any one concrete, such as, well, it's hopeless because we're at war or at peace, or the conservatives are in or the liberals are in, or I got promoted today or I got fired today. 
Your mood may vary day to day, but that's not what we're talking about. The issue in sex is your view of the world as such. Now that is not necessarily the same as your view of other people. Other people are a factor here only if you think that they're evil and they rule or control reality. So the relevant issue is, is reality the kind of place in which you, even if you are good, even if you're perfect, can function? Or is it a cesspool of injustice where you have no chance no matter how terrific you are? So both those elements come in. So obviously if I was using objectivist jargon, I would simplify this by saying self-esteem and benevolent universe are the two factors. But you have to be able to put two crucial premises together. It's a compound fact that you have to be convinced of and then you experience. I am great and so is the world. I can achieve my values in this world because of what I am and because it is a world where values like mine are achievable. Now you can see why either of these elements alone is useless and of no cause for celebration. If you're great but life is hell, what is the point or purpose of the greatness? And on the other hand, if the world is great but you're worthless and can't cope with it, there's no, nothing to celebrate. So these two are not separable. They're distinguishable, but you can't have one completely without the other. Now, this whole entire, what have we, we started at 5.30, so it's one hour to reach this short statement from Ayn Rand. Sex is a celebration of oneself and of existence. <laughs> now, that gives you an idea of literary economy. All right, now, that's as far as I can go going forward, but it's pretty obvious. Let's go now to the topic of uh, sex is uh, metaphysical and see if we can go back down from that to this point. Metaphysics is a branch of philosophy that studies the nature of the universe as a whole. You know, that studies being qua being was Aristotle's definition. So as I think I dictated you, metaphysical means pertaining to reality as a total. That it does not mean just real or pertaining to reality, but pertaining to reality as a whole. The law of gravity is real, but it is a physical law, not a metaphysical one. A is A is a metaphysical law. It pertains to everything in reality and reality as a total. Or, let's put it this way, learning metaphysics is not a metaphysical value. It's a specific, it's an educational value. A metaphysical value would be one relating to reality as a total, such as sex. Now why? We have to work backwards from metaphysical and see how sex relates to reality as a whole. And it's pretty obvious if you've taken it up to uh, what we were calling self-esteem and benevolent universe. Self-esteem is the conviction of your fundamental ability to deal with reality, not necessarily to win any concrete battle or pursuit, but if you have self-esteem, you have it, whether at any given time you're you know, consigned to labor in a quarry like Rourke, or you're standing triumphant and everything is great. The same fundamental premise is operative. I can cope, I can succeed, I can deal, not necessarily with this or that aspect, but with reality as such. That's the idea of the metaphysical element. And just as for Peter Keating, uh, whether he is flush with success from the Cosmos Slotnik building or totally defeated, he feels the same non-selfishness, the same feeling that reality as such, that's the metaphysical element, is beyond me. Now looking at the benevolent universe side of it, the whole point of it is that it pertains to the universe as a total. 
benevolent universe says that the universe, not some particular concrete like a gathering of objectivists in a special place or an audiovisual hookup or something like that, but being qua being is amenable to rational values. So uh, there are two metaphysical elements involved in sex. I am the kind of person who can succeed in reality. That's a reference to reality as such, not to any one segment of it. And reality is the kind of place where my success is possible. Or I am able to deal with existence as such, and existence as such can be dealt with. Now that's a double affirmation. Each side involving a relationship to reality as such. And that is why sex is metaphysical. It involves a view of yourself as you relate to reality as such and what what you are in relation to reality and what reality is in relation to you. Now, if we put all of this together, or I wanted to zip through this, we could go backwards, something like this pattern now. We start with the, on the reductive chain. We start with sex as metaphysical. What do we need to know to reach that conclusion? Well, we had to know that it's a celebration of your own efficacy in reality. We had to know the issue of self-esteem and benevolent universe, which means we had to have come to the conclusion that it's a celebration of your efficacy in reality. That's what would lead us to its metaphysical. How would we come to the conclusion it's a celebration of your own efficacy? Well, we have to grasp that it's a positive, it's generalized self-focus. As against a negative generalized self-focus. But to grasp that it's a positive self-focus, you first have to grasp that it is a generalized self-focus. It's a focus on yourself as a total entity versus, for instance, in work. And how do you grasp that it's a focus on yourself as a total entity? Well, you have to grasp that it involves your two central components, your two central elements mind and body, spiritual and physical. So you have to grasp the issue that it's physical and uh, psychological. Now, everything has to some extent got a combination, almost everything. It's hard to have a pure sensation or a pure uh, uh, emotion without some physical element. But what makes us single out the issue of sex and focus on these two why is why would what would motivate us to go up this whole chain rather than pursuing the toothbrush because we grasp something that differentiates it from everything that makes us start out on the investigative path of what is it and what is it that you grasp directly from experience that makes it stand out its violence, its intensity, and the fact that there, it's not a means to it. And that makes it a question. It's not practical in the sense of, you know, a means to some practical end. And it's that violence, what would it be? And that's where we start. So as I see it, you can go all the way back down and then go back all the way uh, back up. Now, the obvious question just before we finish off with this about sex in the life of an irrational man and this is the question how can a mechanism whose essence is self-celebration be craved by people with no cause whatever for self-celebration in other words if Ayn Rand is right why do self-hating people not simply feel sexless and abstain from the whole field. And here I'm not going to lecture on her answer, but just to remind you, her answer is that everybody needs 
self-esteem, that that's a need inherent in a conceptual being, however irrational he becomes. And if people's policies make self-esteem impossible, they proceed to fake it. Uh, uh, in other words, they establish a phony self-esteem that to some extent mitigates their anxiety and self-doubt. So what the irrational person does is turn the faculty of celebration into a mechanism of escape. Instead of self-celebration, he escapes from self-condemnation through it. And in, instead of affirmation of reality, he escapes from a frightening uh, reality. So it's still metaphysical. The principle of the induction doesn't change. But what he seeks is a negative version of the experience. In other words, I as a total am not all that rock. And the universe will not necessarily squash me. Uh, so he still wants a metaphysical, but this time he wants a reassurance rather than a celebration or an affirmation. Now, a few last points on this topic. The full validation of the Ayn Rand's theory of sex is not just the material we covered today, but also the correct metaphysics in two crucial respects, neither of which I stated yet. One, the axiom that there's only one reality, this one. And two, the principle that mind and body together constitute a single integrated entity. Now, even if you had these two principles, you can't deduce the correct theory of sex. But the point here is that these principles, this metaphysics is a necessary condition. It's necessary but not sufficient. Without the correct metaphysics, you couldn't get anywhere in an inductive study of sex. You, for instance, would have no answer to the Pope if he were here. You didn't have the correct metaphysics, but you heard this whole class. The Pope would not bat an eye at anything that I've said. He would simply say, your inductions are completely wrong. For instance, you talk about self-esteem and rhapsodize about it, about it, but that's a total fraud. If self-esteem is the ability to cope with reality, that means the next life. That's reality. And that's outside your power and depends on God's grace. So you've got to abandon this ridiculous narcissism in favor of hope, faith, and humility. And then he'd say, your whole idea of sex as being so profoundly spiritual is all wrong. You admit that it's a passionate physical. Now you say in part that. But obviously, if it's that, it's of this world, and therefore not of the next. It's therefore not spiritual, by virtue of the fact that it's so significantly physical. Therefore, it's low and materialistic, and that's the exact opposite of an exalted end in itself. So, he would say, that's why we say that the very intensity of the pleasure shows that it's an animal function, and it's evolved only for an unavoidable practical purpose. And that's why really good people, uh, like monks or nuns, uh, shun it and have nothing to do with it. So in other words, a properly trained Catholic would properly dismiss all the inductions if they were simply presented out of context as the product of a corrupt metaphysics. They would say you're making hash of the actual facts that are easily explained on a Catholic basis. Now, I don't mean to say that the whole talk today was uh, inadequate, but it does mean that you cannot answer religionists if you ignore metaphysics. You perform a certain inductive interpretation within a certain framework, and without that framework, in place, you cannot reach Ayn Rand's theory of sex. <clears throat> and that is why so many people can believe, can grasp how the obvious empirical facts that it's so intense and people pursue it for its own sake. Even a lot of psychologists understand fully that it has a tremendous psychological component, but they don't can't go anywhere with that because they're cut off by false metaphysics from being able to go with that. Now, we have to take a detour or an answer question here. What then is the role of a partner if sex is only 
or is essentially a self-focus. Now, the whole topic of sex involves a lot of stuff that doesn't belong to philosophy, but you can't separate it out entirely. And uh, this is a, is, is a psychological element, but we have to just mention this so that it's not totally confusing. I'm just going to indicate the kind of points here that would be involved, but you need a lot of inductions to reach these. Uh, it would be a whole philosophy or theory of sex. I think you're familiar with this point. I'm just trying to answer the question of why would somebody want a partner if this basic view or approach to sex is, is correct. Uh, and I think you're familiar with the point that and we're speaking about a rational person wants the partner because he or she, now I'm not going to keep saying all those pronouns, but you can switch them as you wish in any combination that suits your preference, because he or she represents the sum of his fundamental values. Otherwise, he wouldn't experience a, a profound emotional response such as love. So the woman must, in essential value terms, be just like him or putting it in Aristotle's great term, has to be his alter ego, another self. So that when he looks at and touches her, he sees all of his most crucial, deeply personal values. And the same when she looks at and touches him. She sees her most crucial values. Now, the, the response of each to the other is meaningful precisely because of what they see and respond to is their own essence as they themselves see it. That is what one is flaunting and the other is taking in. Uh, if a woman is indifferent to a man's essence or if she sees in him or cares primarily about anything other than what he regards as his essential, then sex with her to a rational man is dead. It's impossible. And here there's a very eloquent scene from the Fountainhead, a very brief one, I'm going to take a second uh, to read, about Gail Winand when he was 20 and he was in love with this exquisitely beautiful girl. What was her name? Uh, I, can't, I don't think they ever gave her a name. Did they? No. Anyway, <clears throat> this is the paragraph. With I'll just excerpt a little bit. They said little to each other. He felt that everything was understood between them. One evening he spoke. Sitting at her feet, his face raised to her. He allowed his soul to be heard. My darling, anything you wish, anything I am, anything I can ever be, that's what I want to offer you. Not the things I'll get for you, but the thing in me that will make me able to get them. I'm skipping it forward. And she, the girl smiled and asked, Do you think I'm prettier than Maggie Kelly? He got up, he said nothing, and walked out of the house. He never saw that girl again. Now, that is a very condensed uh, uh, version of uh, why, uh, of this point. But the point is that she didn't see or respond to him. Him as a total, as he saw himself. Because in, in proper, meaningful sex to a rational person, the mutual focus is a way for each to underscore and make real an utterly self-centered awareness. E the focus of each on himself or herself. I got, I'm losing my pronouns, so let's put it like this. Sex to a rational man is a totally egotistical or egoistical experience. And the partner makes it more so, which is why he wants the partner. It's the experience I underscored want her. I want her because she's another me. I want that other me to feast on me. See, so that it, what it is is a stress or an underscoring of self-focus and self-awareness. So it, the need of a partner does not contradict uh, uh, the issue that s sex is a self uh, focus. And properly understood, it simply enhances that point. But that was a side excursion. Let's go back to our main line. Sex involves you as a total entity, body, and mind. We're summing it. 
experiencing a, vi a violent pleasure through both attributes, a pleasure you seek for its own sake, and it involves a focus on and positive, obviously, evaluation of your essential self. It's not a focus on any specific skill you have in any specific field, that's the Tiger Woods, but on yourself as such and the world as such. And this latter object, this yourself in the world, has got to in some way involve your highest value because the experience of it leads to the most intense pleasure. Okay? Now we go to clarify, proceed to the other kind of contrast, the third point, the exact opposite of sex. Would be an equivalent focus. That is on you as a total, in the world as a total, not a specialized focus. A generalized focus, but that involves a negative evaluation. Yourself as a total mind and body, as a total person, but now with a condemnation rather than a positive. And do you know what that is called? That's regarded universally as the worst suffering human beings are capable of. And it's the same as sex exactly, but on the negative axis. It's the generalized mind-body, I can't say end in itself, but horror in itself. And what is that? Do you know? An anxiety attack. And you can, you can gain a great understanding of sex by simply clinical observation of anxiety attacks in relation to sexual experiences. And you can get abundant data they differ in everything, but this crucial similarity is uh, what we want to bring out. A man with an anxiety attack, and this is easily elicitable by psychological clinical observation, is terrified regardless of his life situation, his knowledge, his skills, or even his strengths of character. He can be sitting at home safely on his sofa, and suddenly, seemingly out of the blue, have this profound, overwhelming feeling, I can't cope, I'm no good, I'm going crazy, and even I'm going to die. Now, sex is the exact opposite of the same experience. You just reverse everything. You can be trapped in a foxhole with bombs raining down, and this has frequently happened. But uh, people make love under th that circumstance, assuming you're still capable of it. If you're too overcome by fear, you can't do it. But if you can, then regardless of the tangible dangers or of any of your errors or flaws or problems, you still feel, if you can get into it at all, during the act of sex, I am efficacious, I am good, I am in control, I can succeed, I can live I'm fabulous. And in that sense, it's the experience of self-affirmation. Now, if, if we know from egoism that you yourself are your highest value, then sex comes out as being simply the positive experience of this value. That is, of yourself as an entity. What you experience is, by my deepest essence, I'm great. Just as the meaning of the anxiety attack is, by my deepest essence, I am worthless. So if an anxiety attack is an experience of self-condemnation or self-damnation, then, as Ayn Rand put it, sex is the experience of self-celebration. Now you see that both of these estimates, celebration and damnation, belong in the generalized, not the specialized, category. And this is the full, final clarification of why it comes under that category. Self-celebration does not mean I'm great at a given skill. And it doesn't make any difference what skill you're talking about, and even whether you actually excel in it. You can be a great writer and experience pride in being a great writer. That is not what we're talking about as self-celebration. The same goes for anything, hockey, you name it. 
Self-celebration is the idea, I am great, great as such, and then parenthesis, and therefore, potentially at least, I'm great at anything that's important to me and that I decide to work at. But it's not a it's not an inventory of your positives and a sense of satisfaction. That would be a specialized, even if compound, feeling. Similarly, self-condemnation, in the sense we're talking about it here, is not, I am a poor cook, I'm sloppy, I can't write, etc. It's, I am no good. No good as such. No good for anything that really counts. So we've come to the, as far as sex is self-celebration. Now, there's another element that's involved in the generalized feeling, according to Ayn Rand. Uh, we could deduce it from self-celebration. But rather than deduce it, let's reach it as Ayn Rand did, by induction. And this induction is given directly in Atlas Shrugged. She put a certain scene in specifically to illustrate a point about sex. And I'm referring here to the sequence about sex and, and its, its nature. The sequence involving Reardon's attendance at a disgusting political meeting um, you can think of it, it would be like the Philadelphia Summit on Volunteerism. And he is completely sick with disgust, at which point he loses all desire for Dagny, for whom before this event he had an uns unslakable, insatiable passion. Now, I think everyone has experienced equivalents of this asexuality at some point or another. And it has nothing to do with the negative estimate of yourself. And your feeling is rather, I still want to celebrate my own self, but not this moment. Not in a world smeared with the excrement of the White House occupant or his equivalent. So the inductive inference is, it matters to a man's sexual desire what kind of world he thinks he's living in. Now here again, the issue is not specialized. It's not any one concrete, such as, well, it's hopeless because we're at war or at peace, or the conservatives are in or the liberals are in, or I got promoted today or I got fired today. Your mood may vary day to day, but that's not what we're talking about. The issue in sex is your view of the world as such. Now, that is not necessarily the same as your view of other people. Other people are a factor here only if you think that they're evil and they rule or control reality. So the relevant issue is, is reality the kind of place in which you, even if you are good, even if you're perfect, can function? Or is it a cesspool of injustice where you have no chance no matter how terrific you are? So both those elements come in. So obviously if I was using objectivist jargon, I would simplify this by saying self-esteem and benevolent universe are the two factors. But you have to be able to put two crucial premises together. It's a compound fact that you have to be convinced of and then you experience. I am great and so is the world. I can achieve my values in this world because of what I am. And because it is a world where values like mine are achievable. Now you can see why either of these elements alone is useless and of no cause for celebration. If you're great but life is hell, what is the point or purpose of the greatness? And on the other hand, if the world is great but you're worthless and can't cope with it, there's no, nothing to celebrate. So these two are not separable. They're distinguishable, but you can't have one completely without the other. Now, this whole entire, what have we, we started at 5.30, so it's one hour to reach this short statement from Ayn Rand. Sex is a celebration of oneself and of existence. <laughs> now, 
that gives you an idea of literary economy. Now let me give you your uh, homework and uh, then try to take up some questions. The uh, principle I want you, this is a much easier one now, because I don't want to take more than 30, 40 minutes next time on it. Values are objective, is the principle. Now, I don't want you just mechanically to deduce this, say, well, we know objectivity is so-and-so, and we know values have such and such characteristics, therefore values must be objective. I want you to try to reach what you can inductively. Now, obviously, you can take for granted, at the end of your process, the definition of, induction, of uh, objectivity that we reached. You don't have to reach that over again. But this is, I'd like you to structure it this way. Ayn Rand had to make some observations about values early in life, before her theory of concept formation or objectivity, in order to get her knowledge of values to the point where she would think of connecting values to concepts and objectivity. What are the first inductive conclusions you would come to from observation that would lay the groundwork. Remember when we were discussing objectivity, we said there were certain things about knowledge that were elementary and that enabled you to go on. And what are the same, similarly, what are the certain things about values that anyone observed, that Ayn Rand knew before 12, that put her in the right track? And Start with that and see whether or not you are led to then as a next step the need to find some standard of value. I'm just giving you that as a possibility. And then if you could answer that question observationally, then how would you tie in your conclusion to the definition of objectivity? So I'm suggesting a three-part guide here. The preliminary observations that bring you to a knowledge of what values are that is sufficient to then raise the question, what is the standard of all values? The answer to which becomes then obvious, values must be objective. And that's try to do that, it's, that's relatively easy, since you already know the answers, presumably. Uh, and we'll go through that next time. And we will also then take up um, questions. Now I'm deliberately leaving time for questions, so if you have no questions, you're not going to get your money's worth. I have some uh, left over that uh, I can take up. And there are some points that uh, I'd like to uh, cover of a random, not random, but pertaining to different topics that I have had to omit along the way. But I still would like to hear uh, from you if there's anything on your mind. Don't ask just for the sake of it. But, you know, if you have something bothering you or something you'd like to know, you don't even have to sign your question so that if that bothers you, I'm trying to be friendly in answering, but if you are concerned about that, make it anonymous. But try to be egoistic and selfish and get your money's worth and ask, even if you don't think it's a good question. Uh, is if it's on your mind, that's the question you should ask, given that I have the right not to answer it. And as I said at the beginning, I would appreciate questions specifically, I mean, not only, but if you have any questions on induction. I may not know the answers, but I'd like to know anything on your mind that's unanswered, so if I can't answer it next week, and I think it's a worthwhile question, I have an agenda of what to work on for the course that I'm going to give as a follow-up a year from now. Anything you're unclear about, if you had to go out and face reality and induce anything in philosophy, do you feel you're 100% clear on how to go about doing it? 
or if not, is it just confusion about the particular topic, or is because you know anybody can be confused about a particular topic, or is there something about the whole approach that's confusing to you? How it how to work it, or how it starts, or how it develops. If you can formulate any question, I'll do the best I can. Now here are some questions in general that I've accumulated that I haven't answered. Uh, I've got about ten minutes now. Uh, in answer to uh, my friend in Australia who gave me a long paper and said, I know you can't answer the whole thing, but just tell me, is it too rationalistic? You're off the planet or you're on the right track? And I would say of this whole paper, you're definitely on the right track. I just want to point out one thing that I think is of general interest. One error in your essay that may be the key to your confusion. This is on the topic of the common sense list of values. And you have a statement, suppose somebody has a whole bunch of altruist concrete common sense values and he generalizes and builds a whole altruist ethics. Uh, you know, why? What, what would be wrong? Uh, what would stop him? You're still bothered by the idea of what if we take an altruist ethic as common sense, uh, altruist value as common sense. And here is your confusion. You says, Francis is, the, I guess St. Francis is the name of the person. You, you say, um, he then builds a whole uh, um, uh, altruist ethics paren and undermines any pro-life values that he may have inconsistently held. Nobody can escape holding some pro-life values. It is impossible. If you could be consistently altruist and dispense with all pro-life values, that would mean altruism was correct. It was consistent with all facts of reality, and every choice and decision you had to make that would be the truth. The evidence that it's wrong is precisely that you constantly reach contradictions. If you, for instance, just try not to assert yourself, you can't function. If you give up your values, then that's a loss. If you give up everything, you have to stop breathing. So you're in a continuous contradiction. You have to exercise some independent judgment and some thought and some valuing and some satisfying. So it's not as though he may have inconsistently held. He has got to. And that is the whole key to why, even if you start off with wrong values, if you have some right ones, you will find it out. Now that brings me to an excellent letter. I'm going to give Paul Blair uh, credit. I want to read two paragraphs of a letter that he wrote me. Uh, because it's it's excellent on this point. It's an analogy, but it's very it's apropos of. He says he's wondering about all the questions you're getting about the common sense values used in inducing egoism. He thinks they arise from looking at inductive reasoning as if it were rationalistic deduction. Now I'm reading from Paul's letter. The questioners see the process of inducing egoism on analogy with figuring out your taxes. You start by filling in the numbers from your W-2 forms, then perform successive calculations to reach a result. If you copy the numbers down wrong, then the answer you reach is completely incorrect. By this analogy, if you include a false value in the premises of your induction, you can only arrive at a completely erroneous conclusion. Now he offers a better analogy, which I don't think I'd heard before, but it's an excellent analogy. He's, he suggests that he got it from Harry Binswanger. If so, then Harry gets the credit. But it's, listen to this one. A better analogy is solving a jigsaw puzzle. Suppose that among the pieces of your puzzle, someone has added a few pieces from a different puzzle. As you go about solving the puzzle, the extra pieces will make the process more difficult, but they won't ultimately stop you from reaching a solution. Nor will the addition of outside pieces lead to a false solution of the puzzle that incorporates these pieces because the outside pieces just won't fit. And this analogy 
illustrates, he says, how the process of induction is one of classification and integration, not of computation or deduction. I think that's truly excellent, Paul. I want to uh, congratulate you. I don't know uh, whether that is Harry's or not. Harry, can you just unmute and tell me whether that was yours? I'm proud to say it was Gene's. Oh, well, it's an excellent... Uh, I mean, I can, I'm glad I heard about this because I think that is a very, very excellent uh, teaching device. The, uh, in, in the actual real situation, the true analogy, the complete analogy would be that the outside pieces from another puzzle would actually self-destruct when you finish the puzzle because once the contradiction is revealed, they would blow apart. They wouldn't stand there as pieces anymore. So it would be like a puzzle, which when you put it together, all the other pieces are gone. So uh, I don't know if that helps you in Australia, but that's... I mean, you could take one more crack at it. Uh, if I don't get any other questions, I'll go one more round. But to me, that is very helpful. Now here is one that's not really on uh, induction, but it's brief, I think. You talk about the principle that in a mixed economy, controls breed controls. How do you integrate federal deregulation of the airline and trucking industries then? Is the deregulation unreal? No, it's real. Or do the looters ease up now and again for brief periods? Yes. And here you have to grasp that any principle of how human beings operate and what the consequences are going to be happens across time. It has to be long range, not instantaneous, unless you're talking about if you jump off a building, you know, you're going to smash into the pavement. And it has to allow for the fact of free will. Even if you're taking drugs, you can pause before you reach total devastation, go through rehab. The point is only if you don't change the basic thing that drove you to it, you'll go back again and ultimately destroy yourself. But that's ultimately. There's nothing to say it has to go on an inevitable progression from the first shot of marijuana until you, you know, walk the streets a gibbering idiot. Um, uh, now, the same thing is true with regard to the economy. Uh, because of public protest or a brave politician or the blatant failure of some status program, they can drop certain regulations for a while. The fact is, however, that if they don't change the fundamentals, they will have to reinstate them in some form, ultimately. It's just a question of how. And you can see, for example, in the airline industry, not to make this a discussion of economics, right now, you are hearing screams about the prices are so high under, uh, you know, um, unregulated airlines. And there's too many accidents. They're not spending enough on maintenance. And what about all the small towns, you know, in Peoria and so on, that don't have any more airline access? There's a continuous outcry right now. And, of course, uh, why don't, you know, great inventive geniuses come into the field and invent ways of cutting the cost tremendously. Who, what great genius is going to go in when it's just been deregulated and at any moment after he invests his life and his fortune, the regulations can come back in so only the lower types stay in it. And the result is they want to make deals with the government and there's more power in the hands of the government and the FAA, and instead of instituting price cuts, I'm just making a prediction, on an official basis that, uh, that operates by indirect, by threat, by voluntary self-compliance. If there's that much of an outcry and they're getting calls from Washington, they start to control the prices themselves out of fear, which affects the service, etc. And pretty soon, someone in Washington is going to say, this is ridiculous. They're all observing price controls, but they're doing it sporadically and inconsistently. Why don't we have a systematic you know, control and you're back to square one again? So these kind of deregulations are certainly possible and you get a breathing spell from them, but they're not going to do anything in the long run, uh, but come back 
in force. But that the important thing is you don't interpret a principle of human behavior as a deterministic or instantaneous. It takes time, and there's free will and lots of oscillations, and you can thank God for the oscillations, because if it was the way you're projecting it, from beginning to end in one inevitable sequence, then we would all die you know, from the first irrationality or have a dictatorship uh, after it. Okay, I think we're on our time. Um, I, I can answer in one sentence to somebody who knows who he is. Any situation arising in private employment, even if your boss makes impossible requests, is not physical force. If you are free to quit, you cannot accuse your boss of physical force, not unless he ties you up and holds a gun to your head and says, you do the impossible or I'm going to shoot you. But as the example you gave is an irrational boss, but that is not the same as one who threatens physical force. I mean, that example will be of general value, even if you don't know the example. Okay, with that, I'm going to leave you until our last meeting one week from now. Farewell.